Okay, so um, the subject for today's lesson is the Holy Shroud of Turin. And you guys have heard of it before, I'm sure. Um, what we're going to do today is learn about the history and science of the Shroud, which is absolutely fascinating. Okay. And certainly, um, this talk could last many hours, and there'd still be new stuff. I'm going to try to give you guys what I've kind of um, curated or put together as the most important and probably most impressive, okay? And then after that, we'll do a bit of a, as we explain the science, we'll, we'll kind of um, simultaneously reflect on the passion of our Lord. Um, the burial cloth of Christ is really a reflection on his passion, as we can see the wounds, but also on the resurrection, because it's the resurrection that formed the image. And uh, we'll, we'll explain that in a little bit today's presentation. Okay, so this is um, this is the shroud. It's, uh, it's 14 feet long, so uh, it is actually one piece. I just cut, I cut it in half and put it side by side just for the sake of visibility. But it is, um, it is about, uh, it's about a meter wide, 14 feet long. Um, there are different theories about where it came from. It might have been the tablecloth of the Last Supper, possibility. Um, it could have been just the cloth that Joseph of Arim Arimathea provided, because he also provided it to him. We don't know exactly who provided it, but as we're going to see today, it was a pretty special cloth, just even in itself, without the image. All right, so some bullet points of what I think are the most important things. Think of these as, uh, anyone ever asks you about the shroud, these would be your lead-off points, or just your own understanding of the shroud. These would be the things that, um, that you'd want to remember first, okay? So the undeniable fact about the shroud is that it has no pigments. In other words, it's, it's not pink. This is something that doesn't require any faith to affirm. It's simply a scientific fact that no one can identify the source of the image. No one has ever been able to. Because it is no pigment, no brush strokes. It's simply there. Now, in exactly what it consists, I'll talk about, but, but basically it's been singed into the cloths, into the cloth in some kind of inexplicable way. Second point, scientists have studied the blood and have found that it's type AB, all right? And AB blood is, you know, relatively rare in this part of the world, but it's extremely common in Palestine. Uh, not only does that fit where Jesus would have done his ministry in Palestine, but it also fits another, um, another cloth that's in Oviedo, Spain. Now, I'm not going to talk much about that cloth today. But the cool thing about the Sudarium of Oviedo, okay, so let's just kind of remember what the Sudarium was. Okay, so the Sudarium of Oviedo would have um, covered the head of Jesus while his body was being prepared, in order to soak up the blood, because for the Jews, blood was life, blood was sacred, and you didn't want it on the ground. Okay, so the sudarium, this is typical Jewish burial custom. Sudarium placed around because blood's still leaking out, etc. And then the sudarium was removed uh, for the cloth to be put over the, the body of Jesus. And then the sudarium would have been buried with Jesus, but not touching his body. Cool thing though, is that not only is the, the, the blood type the same, but the spots where the blood are on the sudarium exactly match in 120 spots the spots where the blood uh, is in the shroud. Okay? Blood stains appear there. Third, the image is a photographic negative. This is really fascinating. So, um, in the old days of film photography, and you know, film photography still exists, it's still a thing, it's just not common anymore. What you had to do is you'd have to take your pictures. You would put it on a negative, and you develop the negative in a dark room, okay? And then you get the photographic positive. In a photographic negative, the parts that are light on a person are dark, and the parts that are dark on a person are light. So example, for example, my eye sockets are naturally uh, darker, right, if you look at my face. And my nostrils are naturally darker if you look at my face. On a negative, it's the opposite. My nostrils would be the bright spots, and my eye sockets. All right, so. The image of the shroud, then, as a photographic positive, 
is actually a photographic negative, which is something that no one could have even conceived of, right, before the late 18th century. Um, certainly not in middle to, uh, medieval ages. All right, no signs of bias decomposition. This goes with the fact that Jesus rose before he could be decomposed. Right? He was buried, but there wasn't enough time for decomposition to set in, and that's why the shroud shows no signs of decaying flesh. 3D information, this is really fascinating. This actually has to do with space. So there's, there's a, a computer graphics analysis that's been around really uh, for years called BPA, and here's what it does. They use this to map the moon's surface. How do they map the moon's surface, Mr. Feynman? Do they have to walk every every uh, square foot of it? No. You can map the moon's surface because the difference in intensity depends on the distance. Okay, what does this have to do with the shroud? So pretend that this that this is the burial cloth. Notice it's over my face right now. Kind of like how it would be on Jesus' face. And notice as I'm talking to you, right, the tip of my nose is clearly touching. But the recess of my eye socket is not touching, nor is my nostril, nor is the little space under my bottom lip. What does this mean, guys? It means that some parts of my face are touching the cloth, some parts are relatively far from the cloth, and some parts are midway. Therefore, there is a difference in intensity of how the image was etched into the cloth based on how far the cloth was from the body of Jesus. And that image, if we apply the same BPA technology to the shroud as was applied to the face of the moon, it gives us the three-dimensional image of Jesus Christ's face. Not only his face, but of his entire body, so much so that there is a 3D statue of Jesus Christ that was extracted entirely from the shroud. Right? And that statue in bronze still exists. Uh, it still exists in Italy. Uh, it contains springtime pollens from Palestine. Why is this important? Well, for, for uh, two reasons. One is that the pollens found there um, are, are from all the places the shroud has been. It's been in a bunch of places. But the ones that are there that show it was in Jerusalem are only from Jerusalem or from Palestine and only, only blossom in the springtime, which is when Jesus died. Here is uh, a bit of a negative thing that has become a positive. Uh, probably the first thing that you'll hear when you talk about the shroud of people who, you know, don't know much about it, or perhaps are just uh, anti-Christian or whatever, <clears throat> is they're going to say that the carbon-14 dating <coughs> invalidated. In 1988, there was a big study <clears throat> and then it was in the media and all this stuff that, that three scientists had independently proven that the shroud was of medieval origin. Okay, so that if the shroud's of medieval origin, it can't be the burial cloth of Christ, which means it's some kind of elaborate forgery. That's basically what the study concluded. However, in 2005, it was found that the 1988 study was completely wrong. Completely wrong. There is not a shred of credibility anymore about the carbon-14 study that was done on the shroud, which means there is no longer a shred of negative scientific evidence against the shroud. Zero. <coughs> Nothing. Now, this is important also because you know how false narratives can be diffused. All people have to do is say a lie enough times and then, you know, the masses believe it. Most people still believe that the carbon-14 dating show the shroud was inauthentic, completely false, and you should know that. Later on, I'm going to talk about what sample they actually took. Now, we're getting into the... Oh, yes, um, so, the, were the three scientists actually working together, and we just didn't know it? They were working together, but did the tests in separate locations, which was one of the protocols that, were, uh, that, were, that was established at the time. But yeah, collaborated, but did test in different locations. Only the uppermost surface of the fibrils, okay, so fibrils then we're talking about what actually makes up 
the shroud, the bits of cloth. Um, and notice how thin it is, right? Think about one of your hairs and cut that down to 120. That's how thin the, um, the image is. Okay, so the image is not pink. The image is literally burned into the fibers. But the depth of burn is 1 20th of a human hair. Now, in labs, they have simulated this in one small portion of a cloth with something called an eczema laser. Eczema laser is a high-powered ultraviolet laser. That's uh, one of the, the, the uses you might be familiar with is laser surgery for eyes, right? LASIK. Um, well, they've been able to simulate this for one tiny bit of cloth, and it's you know, a lot of power, it's a high-powered laser. The amount of power that would be required to do this for an entire cloth is in the billion watt range, which is extreme, okay? That's extreme, and it's so extreme that we wouldn't be able to produce enough power at one time to, to etch uh, any kind of image in a cloth, such as the one that the shroud has. Therefore, the shroud image cannot be du duplicated with modern technology. Much less could it have been produced with ancient technology or even medieval. Blood stains show evidence of torture, okay? The body of Christ was tortured. And the church never says, oh, you have to accept that the man in the shroud was Jesus Christ. Of course not. You're completely free. You can be saved whether you believe that or not. But what I'm showing you in today's lesson is there is really a, a great deal of evidence for its authenticity and no evidence to its contrary. Okay, now, what does this mean, cardiac arrest? What it means is that, based on evidence from the shroud, okay, especially the fact that the blood and the serum, or the liquid part, uh, or the watery part of the blood had been separated, which is only true in a dead body. This was true in the heart that was pierced, okay? And based on the wounds that we're about to examine in the image. Um, the, the most likely cause of death of Jesus Christ was shock. It wasn't asphyxiation, okay? Crucifixion victims did asphyxiate. It usually took three days with a terrible agonizing death. Jesus was kind of quick, he lost a lot of blood, and we know that he talked up until the very end. Asphyxiating people don't do this. So even the Gospels give us a clue as to the cause of death. But traumatic shock is when there's just so much emotional and physical pain that your body stops. That is a thing, it has happened. And hypovolemic shock is when there's simply not enough blood for the heart to pump. There is not enough blood for the heart to pump, and so the heart stops. Therefore, this is the most likely cause of death of Jesus Christ, all hanging on the cross. Images of Roman lepton coins, and this is really fascinating. At the very end of the, of the lesson, I'm going to show you these lepton coins. You're, you're going to see them. Um, but since they were coined in 29 AD, it lines up with all the historical evidence that shows that Jesus died during the, the governorship of Pontius Pilate, which lasted from 26 to 36 AD. It was a 10-year governorship. And this is smack dab in the middle of that. Who remembers, or can you guys think of why there were coins on Jesus' eyes before the shroud covered him? Mr. Stephanie. Because that was like their custom with the coins in the eyes. That's right, it was like their custom, and they'd gotten it from the Greeks, and the Greeks had done it because you know you pay the ferryman. But it was a custom. So it's interesting though that the shroud lines up with history. Now, it's not just the carbon dating, right? That's not the best way to date things even. Carbon dating is good for things when accuracy within a thousand years is fine. But when you want something more precise, you use more modern tests. Vanilla decay talks about the amount of vanilla that's in a cloth, which decays over time. Infrared spectroscopy is where you actually uh, study the infrared spectrum of, uh, of an artifact. Tension compressibility talk or, or speaks to the fact that um, cloths will lose their tension and compressibility over time. And you can, you can measure that. You can actually measure that directly on the shroud to see how old it is. And those all point to a date of about 50 AD. Now, does that mean that Jesus died in 50 AD? Of course it doesn't. But it means that the best scientific tests of today put the shroud in the first century. 
And of course, these tests aren't going to be accurate to within a year. They're going to be accurate to within decades. So 50 AD plus or minus decades puts us right there at the time of Jesus. Uh, yes, Dan? How do they test tension compressibility as well? They actually stretch and compress the fibrils. And based on how they stretch and compress the fibrils, they can tell how old it is. Yeah. This is a very reliable test that has been done on the shroud. All right, so the provenance of the shroud, or where it comes from, it's had kind of a colorful history. And, you know, this, this itinerary of the shroud is really the best that scientists and historians can do of the evidence that has been presented. Okay, it definitely started in Jerusalem. It was moved to Edessa when, um, when Jerusalem fell. Okay, actually, Jerusalem fell uh, officially in 638, okay? But Jerusalem was already being threatened in 544, and so it was moved to Edessa for safety. But then, Edessa fell to the, to the Muslims in 944, and so it was moved for safekeeping to Constantinople, which was the seat of the Roman Empire in the east, and it was also, it was also of course, the seat of the church in the east. Then, look at this big trip. Look at this big trip. Well, something very important happened in 1204, which was the sack of Constantinople by the members of the Fourth Crusade. It was a very unfortunate event in history, but it did happen. And so, who were the caretakers of the Holy Shroud? Well, traditionally, they were the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar were founded in Jerusalem in 1099, okay, after the First Crusade. And they were entrusted with the care of relics, including the Holy Grail, which no one knows where it is, and the Holy Shroud. Now, what does this have to do with our story? Well, it was moved out of Constantinople for the sack because they didn't want raiders to uh, get their hands on it. And then it was moved to Lyrae, France, by this guy named Geoffrey de Charnay. Geoffrey de Charnay was a direct descendant of the Grand Knights Templar Master who was burned at the stake in France in 1307. Now, the, the, the Templars were suppressed in 1307 by Philip the Fair, right? And officially disbanded in 1314. But, but the order still went on underground. And naturally, if someone possessed the shroud, they would keep it in the family for the protection of such an important relic. And that's why this name is so important. In fact, not only is he descendant, but the Grand Master Burn at the Stake had the same exact first name as well. So it was probably protected by the Knights Templar, not only in Constantinople, but also in the Ray France. This is where it first becomes public. It first becomes public because Geoffrey de Charnay uh, allows the faithful to venerate it. <coughs> then it was moved to Chambéry, where there was a better chapel. Hey. Suffered a fire in 1532. Big damage, and um, they actually had to repair it. I mean, you close that door, please. They, uh, nuns, nuns of Chambéry had to repair it with patches, and so there are many patches on the shroud. You're going to see those soon. And then finally, at the request of Saint Charles Borromeo, it was brought to Turin, where he was bishop, and it's been in Turin ever since the days of Borromeo to the present day. There was a very big fire in 1997 uh, that is. Um, widely considered to have been arson, probably by an enemy of the Shroud, perhaps someone who was a Satan worshiper, we don't know for sure. But it was heroically saved by firemen who rushed into the burning building and were able to save the Shroud from flames. Okay, so that's its provenance. Let's talk more about the cloth itself. Okay, so you can see here it's got this herringbone weave, really kind of neat herringbone weave. And this was, this was not common of cloths at the time because it was very expensive to make such a cloth. It's kind of common sense why it's expensive. It's hard to make that, that pattern, right? It takes skilled weaving. Which means that the cloth probably belonged to a rich man who was either the owner of the upper room where the last supper happened, or he was Joseph of Arimathea, who was also a wealthy member of the Sanhedrin. Now, I want you to look at how Jesus was wrapped. Okay? This was Jewish burial custom. The 14-foot cloth 
would then be folded over his body, just like you see here. Notice no sudarium, because by then the sudarium had been removed, right, and was going to be buried in the same tomb as the body. And so this is what he would have looked like. This is also the posture he would have had um, as they were wrapping up his body. Okay, now let's get into the image itself. So the photo positive is what people knew for hundreds of years until 1898. And in 1898, the photographer Secondo Pia was given permission to photograph the trial, bring the negatives to a dark room. And that's where what he saw blew his mind because the negatives are what we would consider a positive. Now let me explain that. Notice, in the positive, eye sockets are light. Under the nostril is light. Under the lip is light. But in the negative, it's the opposite. Which means that the shroud is a photographic negative. And when you do the negative of the negative, you get a uh, positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the photo negative of the shroud is the positive. And the photo positive of the shroud is the negative. Okay, but no one understood this until modern photography. Okay, so let's talk about some blood stains. You can prominently see some. So, yes, photograph a negative, true. But remember, what we're talking about is the uh, 1 20th uh, thickness singeing of the fibrils. That's the image. The image is also superimposed on the image, our blood stains, actual blood stains. And so, of course, in the pho photographic positive, you're going to see those as, as blood because that's what they are. Okay, so blood from the base of the hand, not between the ulna and radius, not the palm, but the base of the hand. Um, we can see uh, blood from the, the, the thorns. And remember that the, the, the head is very vascular, which means it bleeds a lot. While the thorns were on Jesus' head, there would have been so much blood that it filled his eyes and probably it was hard for him to see. And even after the sudarium had taken away a lot of that blood, there was enough left to make stains. We see his blood-stained ponytail. Yes, Jesus wore a ponytail. This is how Jewish men of the time wore their hair. They had beards, and they had their hair in a ponytail. And so we can see part of that ponytail here, and we can see the blood stains on the ponytail. They're caused by the, uh, uh, caused by the, the, the crown. We're gonna see, uh, I'm gonna give a close-up pretty soon of the lance wound, which we'll see um, has the perfect shape that matches Roman lances of the time. And if you look closely, you can see a bunch of dots all on the backs of the legs and the back. And all those dots are bits of blood from the scourging ones. Mr. Stephanie. What are all those like triangles? Are those the patches? Yes. Very good question, Daniel. Those are patches. Okay. So we see a couple of things here. Um, we see patches which were sewn in by the nuns of Chambéry after the great fire there. And we also see water stains because when they put the fire out, they did it with water and that stained the cloth. So the triangular patches and the water stains are both consequences of that fire that almost destroyed the shroud, but didn't. Why is it in corners? Because the time the shroud was folded up into a square and the, the silver casing of the shroud actually started to melt and, and, and destroyed the parts of the cloth. So these are medieval patches that were put on to preserve the integrity of the cloth. Very good question. <laughs> All right, now in the photographic negative, right, which would be a positive for us, we can see, basically we can see what Jesus looked like. This is the closest thing we have to a photograph of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the closest thing we have to a photograph. In fact, better said, it is a photograph. Not in the traditional sense with a camera, but in the sense that it's an image made with light. Right, the XMR laser type thing. That image is a photograph of Jesus. And we can see uh, a lot of details here. We can see the scourge wounds. Actually, you see the scourge wounds even more clearly uh, on this image. And you can see the blood even more clearly because now, instead of being dark spots, the blood stains are light spots. Since it's a negative, things have been swapped. Notice four fingers. 
not five. And that's because when you, when, when nails went through the base of his hands, they severed the median nerve. And, uh, and a medical consequence of that is when you sever the median nerve, right, the thumb goes in as a reaction. And so Jesus' thumbs were locked into this position from the moment of nailing up. That's why you don't see his thumbs. All right, now, take a look at this close-up of the cloth. Um, I want you to pay attention especially to number three. This is where they took the sample for the carbon data. What problem do you guys see with this scientifically? What problem do we see? Mr. Rogers? It kind of looks like a patch area. They took the sample from a patch. I mean, come on. Either they had malicious intent and wanted to prove it as some kind of hoax, or they were just being incompetent. Or maybe it was a mix, I don't know, maybe we'll never know. But the fact is, that alone invalidates the 1988 carbon-14 study, because it's a medieval patch. You want to study an artifact, you take from the dang artifact. You don't take from the patch. And guys, that is the dishonesty and or incompetence that was shown in 1988 by those scientists. Um, Mr. Rogers? Did they know about the patches? Of course they knew about the patch. And how did they? Because everyone sees the patches, right? Yeah. Daniel, Daniel said, Mr. Fryman, what are the triangles? What? Everyone can see that this is not part of the original cloth. Okay. Now, is it possible, Nate, that maybe they were ignorant? It's possible. I don't think it's likely, but it's possible. So what, what are really three reasons? Ignorance, malice, incompetence, or perhaps a mix. We don't know, but the bottom line is this was not a valid carbon dating study at all. And that wasn't definitively proven until uh, 2005 when Ray, Reg Ray Rogers published it in a peer-reviewed journal called Thermochemica Acta, reviewed by thousands of scientists throughout the world, meaning he knew his stuff, and so did the scientists who read his article. And all of them will concur that 1988 study is false. It's false. All right, now these are the pollens. This is done with a scanning electron microscope, and we can see um, these are the pollens that not only are unique to Palestine, but also um, flower in March and April, corresponding to the time of Jesus' death. Okay, now the second half of the lesson, we're still going to talk about some science, but we're going to apply it now to what Jesus went through in the Passion. And this is actually important because the Gospels give good details. The Gospels don't give all the gory details about what crucifixion really meant. And that's what I'm going to give you now. All right, so this is how crucifixion happened in Roman days. Very few victims carried the entire cross, meaning that most likely Jesus did not carry the entire cross. He carried the cross beam, which was called the patibulum. Okay? And the, keep in mind, crucifixion victims and crucifixion as a methodology is very well documented. This is what Romans were experts at. That's how we know this stuff. Now, the patibulum itself was anywhere from 100 to 120 pounds. Imagine 100 to 120 pounds on your shoulders when you're already weak. That's ex insanely difficult to carry. Okay, so this doesn't take anything away from the carrying the cross. It's just how it actually happened. Okay, so the steepes, or the post, the steepes was kept by the Romans in place, either as a freestanding post or as part of a scaffold. And then the patibulum, which was carried by the criminal, was then, with this slot, put into place at the top so that the victim could hang. So this is the moment when he's already been nailed and the Romans are lifting him up, all that weight being suspended by two raw wounds. And they're going to pop him into place at the top of that so that he can asphyxiate to death, which was the intention. All right. Where did the nails go? In a lot of art, you're gonna see the nails going into the palms, okay? This was a place where Romans put nails, but they would only do that if they had ropes, such as we see in the movie, The Passion of the Christ. The movie, The Passion of the Christ, while it is a good movie, um, 
I think makes one mistake, and that is that they don't really, they don't consult the Shroud at all. They consult the visions of Anne Catherine Emmerich, which are fine, right? Personally, and I think a lot of people would agree with this, the Shroud carries more weight. Um, but, but this would be typical art, right? Nail and palm and, and, and uh, ropes to support. The reason you need the ropes is because if you put the nail in the palm, right, the, the body will sag so much that it's going to rip through the palm and all this flesh will just rip out and it wouldn't support the body. Now, the, the, the Romans had two other solutions for that. You put the nail on the base of the hands, you get it in the bones, that supports the weight. Or you put it between the ulna and the radius, and that would support the weight too. The shroud tells us that it was in the base of the hands. Okay, so find the base of your hands, pinch that, and if you pinch it hard right in the base, you'll feel some bones in there, and imagine a nail going through where your fingernail is currently pinch pinching. That's what went through, and these were serious nails, folks. They were seven to nine inches long, and they were about a half inch in diameter. Imagine a half inch in diameter nail going through those bones where there isn't even room for a quarter inch. So the, the bones had to be split as well as all this was happening. Anatomically, it would look like this. The Romans were expert executioners, so they knew exactly where to find these points, right? Sometimes they put nails right there, but in Christ's case, they put nails right here where the metacarpals are, because they knew that if you force the metacarpals apart, you can then support a body. And that's how Jesus suffered. We see the blood stain directly corresponding to the base of the hand. Of course, blood would have been on the uh, inside and the outside of that one. Now, the scourge marks, right? We talked about the scourge marks. What caused these? What caused these was the Roman flag room. The Roman flag room was the punishment uh, instrument par excellence because you had leather straps and then you had um, dumbbell-shaped bits of bone or metal or stone, kind of like these. This is classic Roman flag room right there. And Jesus was lashed with these. Now, one theory that we can get by reading the Gospel of John is that Pilate asked for the scourging and then brought him back and showed him to the people and he said, Behold the man, Eche Homo, because he was hoping the crowd might take pity on him or think that it was enough. But they didn't. They said, Crucify him. Pilate probably had the intention of this being enough because certainly it was a brutal torture. Right? Jim Caviezel, who filmed The Passion, said that one of the lashes in that scene missed the protective plate and actually hit him and knocked the wind out of him, meaning he couldn't even breathe for a minute. Jesus got hit by 39 of these lashes. And each one of those 39 had two or three parts of the flag, meaning that he had up to 120 wounds just from the flag. Now the shroud gives abundant evidence of this with the blood stains. All right, the crown of thorns. So there's the blood-stained ponytail. You can see that little zoom in, that inset there. And the, 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 the thorns probably look like that. Now, what the shroud tells us, information-wise, is, is not that it was a circlet-type crown, which is normally how it's depicted in art, a circle of thorns. The shroud tells us that this was a helmet of thorns. It was a cap of thorns because on the shroud we have we have um, blood stains all over the scalp area that are equivalent, meaning that Jesus was fitted with a cap of thorns. And what the Gospels tell us is that the Roman soldiers kept hitting him on the head with a stick to drive those thorns into his head. That's brutal, right? The Romans were great executioners, and they definitely mistreated Jesus that day in ways that are hard for us to even imagine. Now, what's the sense of this? Pain saves us? No, the sense of this is that love saves us. But the proof of that love is in how much pain he suffered. Okay, it's important to remember that. The, the essence of all these gory stuff that we're talking about now isn't to glorify the gore. It's to glorify the love of the one who suffered all this for us. That's the point of it. It's a positive thing not a negative thing. All right, so I like this image because 
you can see some of that herringbone weave. You can see some of that herringbone weave. Um, you can see a close-up of what is the closest thing to a photo, or is a photo of Jesus. Um, the creases are really just from damage over the time, you know, the fire, the transportation that's had in 2000 years. <coughs> it's amazing that the cloth is still held up in all this time instead of just being caved, but it has held up. We see the most prominent thorn wound there, and keep in mind, this is after the Sudarium. The Sudarium was blood soaked and got all kinds of blood coming from his nose and head. But even after the Sudarium was removed, blood continued to ooze out and that was left onto the surface of the shroud. Okay, now the foot wound. The foot wound was in the phalanges. Okay, so it wasn't in the metatarsals. It was in the phalanges, specifically between the second and third phalanges. And why would the Romans put it there? Because they knew that that also would support a sagging body. And sure enough, that's what it did for Jesus. Now, the shroud tells us because uh, the, the, the foot is flat and the blood stains, these are, this is a, um, a painting representation of what's, of what's apparent here. It's not as easy to see on the actual image, but what we see is that um, the blood stains indicate a flat foot so instead of Jesus having a pedestal, which is, um, you normally see that on crucifixes, he had no pedestal. The foot was nailed flat to the steep end, sort of post. And then the other foot was nailed on top of that with one long nail, remember, seven to nine inches. And so that one nail would have gone through two feet at the same time. Four piercing wounds, but only three nails. All right, now, let's talk about Let's talk about the hours that Jesus went on the cross. So think about this for a second. The only thing holding him up were painful wounds in the metacarpals, where bones had been split apart, and the median nerve severed. Median nerve causing not only the retraction of the thumbs, but also pain throughout his entire body. While writhing, that only increased the pain. And as if the wrist wounds weren't bad enough, those then held them up, and then they topped it off with two wounds to the feet. Okay, but what about the three hours? So during the three hours, it's hard to represent, but I'm not gonna put my foot on the back, but kind of just give you an idea. During the three hours, Jesus had two positions. This was one position, and that was two. That was, now why do we know this? Why do we know he had two positions? Because of the shroud. The shroud shows us two distinctive paths of blood flow that you can easily trace especially on the arms, that show that some of the time he was like this, some of the time he was like this. So when he was like this, he would have been legs bent, up, bent, up. He spent three hours in these two positions. Now why, do these, why these three two, uh, two positions? Because this is a position in which you can breathe, right? But your legs are on fire because you can't hold up your weight. And this is the position in which you choke but you've got to give your legs a rest, okay? Choking, choking, legs get a break. Legs on fire, take a few breaths. Choking, choking, legs get a break. Legs on fire, but take a few breaths. Jesus alternated between choking to death, well, here's the breathing position. Breathing position, choking to death, breathing, breathing, choking. He did this for three hours. Crucifixion victims would often do it for three days. Jesus didn't last long because of all the pain he'd already gone through plus dehydration, rejection, and many other things, indicating probable cause of death was hypovolemic shock and traumatic shock. Okay, so he's in these two positions, right? He's like that, or he's breathing. Breathing, choking, breathing, choking. And during his breathing moments, his seven last words. And during his choking moments, he was just trying to give his legs a break so that he could go in for the next round of breaths. It'd be like undergoing water torture, where they stick your head in, and then bring your head up, take some quick breaths, stick your head in, bring your head up, be like waterboarding, so Jesus went through this for three hours on the cross. With all the wounds that we've already described in the earlier part of this presentation. Wounds that are well documented in the shroud. By peer-reviewed science, that is incontrovertible ever since the invalidation of the 1988 carbon dating study, definitively overturned in 2005. 
Okay, so Jesus then was asphyxiating in this position. But he didn't die of asphyxiation because an asphyxiation victim doesn't talk. He's just gasping for breath. And Jesus did talk. He talked not during these moments, but during these moments of breath. Choke, breathe and talk. Choke, breathe and talk. Choke, breathe and talk. Okay. Until finally hypovolemia and trauma caught up to him and actually caused the cardiac arrest. And all of this, guys, is studied by many doctors and scientists over the centuries, especially the last 200 years, that show us the clearest picture of what the crucifixion meant for Jesus. Okay. Roman history also helps to fill in the blanks. Now, when Jesus died, after three hours, what reaction did Pilate have when Joseph of Arimathea asked for the body? You guys remember? What reaction did Pilate have when Joseph asked for the body? Uh, Mr. Rogers? Uh, was he surprised? He was surprised. Why was he surprised? Because usually it takes way longer. Exactly. Usually, guys, this would take several days. Excruciating pain. In fact, this is the word where the word excruciating comes from. Ex crucis, from or out of the cross, because it was considered the worst, most painful death you could go through. Because you would asphyxiate and dehydrate over a course of three days. But Jesus, three hours, because he had already lost a lot of blood and water with the scourging and everything else. Okay. Now, Pilate, who was surprised that Jesus had lasted only three hours, wanted to make sure he was dead. And that's why he ordered the soldiers to do this. And soldiers, they did not break the legs of Jesus because they knew he was dead, right? They usually broke the legs of crucifixion victims so that, remember the two positions, breathe, choke, breathe, choke, breathe, choke. Break the legs, pure choke, and then you die. This happened to the good thief and the bad thief, right? The soldiers didn't do it to Jesus because they could clearly see he was already dead. But just to follow orders, they went between ribs five and six, since, remember, expert executioners, they knew that that was the, the fastest way to get to the heart. Straight up into the heart, blood and water flowed out. The shroud shows us a bloody portion of the bloodstream and a serum or liquid portion of the bloodstream, which can only happen in a dead heart. And the reason that can only happen in a dead heart is only dead blood, no longer being pumped, has a chance for the two densities to separate. The denser hemoglobin rich portion and the less dense uh, plasma or serum portion. And this is why blood and water come out. They came from two places. They came from the heart, where both had begun to separate, and they came from the space between the ribs and the lungs. This is called the hemothorax. The hemothorax is when the space, the small space between the rib, the rib cage, and your lungs, when that little space fills up with blood. That's called a hemothorax, which often happens because of blood trauma, such as the scourging. And so the blood and water coming forth inside of Christ was from both the dead heart and the hemothorax. It had two sources. Now what do hemothoraxes do? Well, one thing they do is they put a lot of pressure on the lungs, making it hard to breathe. Another reason why Jesus didn't last more than three hours. Now, this is fascinating. These, these are blood patterns, blood stains from the lens. But I want you guys to pay attention to something. This has also been well studied. Notice that there is a perfect elliptical shape here from which all the other blood flowed. They've studied Roman lances of the time and have found that the dimensions are an exact match. The dimensions of that elliptical wound are an exact match of Roman lance heads of the first century. Okay. Now again, am I saying that you need to believe that the man of the shroud is Jesus Christ to be a good Catholic? Of course I'm not saying that. <coughs> this is not dogma. But I'm presenting it to you guys for two reasons today. A, there is no more scientific evidence, not a shred, that can be used to controvert the authenticity of the shroud. But the other reason is, the shroud tells us all kinds of great information about what Jesus actually suffered on Good Friday, which helps us on Holy Thursday in this trio to meditate on, on our Lord. 
and to accompany him in his passion. The sense of these three days, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, is to accompany Jesus in his passion. Jesus, who is outside of time and sees our fidelity, can literally be consoled in his passion 2,000 years ago. And think about that for a second. Am I saying that our fidelity and our remembering of Christ in these holy days can actually console him on the day of his death? Yes, I'm definitely saying that. Because Jesus, as man, is in time, but Jesus as God is outside of time. Which means our consolation of, of the Lord is literally backwards applied by a God for whom time does not exist. Okay, this is what the tomb looked like. Heavy stone, about 2,000 pounds, that would be rolled over the opening. The opening usually went down into the earth, and tombs were often uh, hewn out of rock. The Gospels tell us that this was a tomb in which no one had yet been laid, and it belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. Probably Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man, member of the Sanhedrin, had had it hewn out of the rock for himself, for his own family, but gave that to Jesus. So then Jesus would have been put in here, stone rolled over, and then Jesus would have been in complete and utter darkness. Same darkness that the unborn Lord was in, in the womb, right? Jesus was conceived in the dark, physically dark womb of Mary. He also ended his life in the physically dark room of the tomb. Okay, so, um, sorry about that. Let me just go that last one one more time. We have a couple minutes and we're almost done, which is good. Okay, so this is how we would have looked in the tomb. Uh, notice that you've got, you've got the 14 foot cloth folded over. Blood still losing out, we see that in the shroud, right? And you've got the sudarium. Sudarium had covered the head during the burial process, but been taken off. In Gospel of John, right, in John 20, we see how John and Peter run to the tomb, and what does John see? The linens, and off to itself, he also sees the sudarium. Read the Gospel later on, and you'll see that there are two cloths that St. John sees, sees and believes in John 20. All right, now, 14-foot cloth, right, covered, Sudarium in a niche, and this would have been the posture of the buried Christ. How was the image produced? Remember, we talked about the eczema lasers. We talked about the one billion lots. The, the, the image was produced in a way that we can't understand mysteriously, but it was some kind of sudden outburst of radiation and energy similar to what's produced by external lasers that have been simulated in the lab. Sudden outburst, boom! Which means the body passed through the cloth. The cells of Jesus' body in the moment of revivification, revivification and glorification, in that moment, the cells radiated outward, etching the 1 20th inch uh, singeing of the fibers, the outermost surface of the fibers. It was some kind of outward burst that was what the moment of the resurrection was like. Now, exactly how, how that happened, or how it worked, well, no one knows. But the shroud tells us that it was a burst of energy. It's the most reasonable scientific hypothesis for what could produce that 1 20th inch singeing of the fibers. Okay, so some last cool things. I told you I would show you the lepton, right? We have two. We've got, we've got a dilepton lituus, and we have a lepton simplum. These were both lepton-type coins. And scanning electron microscopes have shown us that they were coined in 29 AD. Smack dab in the middle of the reign of Pontius Pilate from 26 to 36. Now remember I told you about the uh, mapping of the moon surface, VPA technology and the cloth on my face. This is what they can extract from that that has since been turned into a three-dimensional bronze image, which is on display in Rome right now. Okay, and then we can also see that same thing. Notice. 3D image contained in the shroud that can then be uh, used to construct an image of the face. Not just a two-dimensional image, but a three-dimensional image. And we see a little bit of that too. This is one time with the scanning electron microscope. All right, so guys, <coughs> I've given you the basics of the science and history of the shroud. Hopefully, it will also help you to understand better what the crucifixion actually meant the horrific torture that it was. Uh, the Gospels don't go into the gory details, 
but today we've gone into the gory details. And I encourage you during these holy days of Holy Triduum to accompany Christ. Read the Gospels, put yourself there, and console Christ um, during his passion. What you do now can actually console him because he, as God, is outside of time. He, on Good Friday, did enjoy and be and was consoled by what we do for him now. All right. Thank you.